Hello again, Melissa. Hello again, Bill. Uh, another edition of the Weekend Blog here at bloggingheads.tv. If you're not too hungover from the uh, fifth year anniversary festivities last week, uh, great to have you back, Melissa. Why don't you tell uh, the folks uh, watching uh, where you blog and where they can hear your stuff? Okay, well, I blog at libertypundits.com and dot net. Actually, dot, the dot com is um, conservative podcasting, and all the you know conservative libertarian blogs on the right are at conser- are libertypundits.com, and libertypundits.net is are a bunch of bloggers, and I own both those sites. And then Melissa tweets on Twitter, of course. Right, you're probably one of the, the most prolific conservatives on Twitter. Uh, and one of the preeminent conservative podcasters, I would say. Oh, well, uh, thank you. No, my pleasure. Um, and I'm Bill Sher with Campaign for America's Future, which is at ourfuture.org. Uh, also the founder of liberaloasis.com, where I also podcast the Liberal Oasis radio show. Um, we were talking before that uh, there seem to be different issues that uh, liberal and conservative bloggers were focusing on this week, yet there was some uh, common ground on the, the TSA scanners. Uh, why don't you uh, explain uh, the issue there? Well, everybody's starting to kind of throw a fit about the scanning machines, and the um, TSA has come out with new standards for searching people getting through security in airports, and it's a lot more invasive. If you don't do one of the body scanners, which it's called like a scanner machine, and you go in there and they they kind of take a circular x-ray of your front and back, and if you decline to do that, then you get a kind of uh, somewhere between a search and a doctor's exam (laughs) based on some of the people who've gone through it. So that's what's happening, and it's causing a lot of outrage. Uh, On on the left, over at uh, Crooks and Liars and Nicole Bell, uh, I mean, there's definitely, you know, a big civil libertarian streak among a lot of liberal liberal bloggers uh, saying... uh, it's pretty clear that I would not choose to be full body scanned if I was still doing that, because no matter what TSA says, I'm not convinced that repeated expression of concern at what point do we have to sacrifice for much liberty for the sake of security, besides the argument that the entire policy is ridiculously reactive to the underwear bomber, not really making it safer, it ignores the reality that if someone was really determined to execute a terrorist act, they would simply find ways around the new rules. Uh, and if an agent tries to assure you that the full body scans are private, no one uh, but them will see them, Think again. So I think that sort of summarizes uh, the uh, the range of uh, of arguments there, and uh, and she also talks about there is a a national opt out day being proposed uh, for the Wednesday before Thanksgiving uh, to send a message to lawmakers that we demand change. Uh, we have the right to privacy, and buying a plane ticket should not mean that we're guilty until proven innocent. Uh, and uh, I. That that seems to be a, a widespread feeling on left and right. So I think there's civil libertarian streaks on both. But I would note that uh, for those who are not in that camp mm-hmm. on the left, uh, Kevin Drum, uh, at who blogs about the Jones now, uh, writes, so how about those backscatter scanners? Everybody hates them. Don't touch my junk. It's about to be added to live free or die. Uh, but uh, I'm already on record as not caring. Uh, uh, basically saying uh, the health concerns are pretty obviously bogus, just an excuse piled onto the bonfire to help the cause. Um, I, I'm a phlegmatic middle-aged man. I understand everyone not, not everyone feels as cavalierly about this as I do. I think it's crazy, but I get it. Um, but crazy aside, I just want to know if the things work. That's a hundred times more important than whether they confirm to a board TSA screener that I really ought to lose a few pounds. And here's the thing, it sure seems as if they do work. It's the very fact that they work that has everyone so outraged. They show things that an ordinary scanner can't. Um, is there anyone on the right um, making that counterterrorism argument, or is everyone on the right falling to the civil libertarian side of the coin? Well, it's interesting because most of the people are falling, falling into the civil libertarian thing, but... There was a, and I can't remember who did the poll, maybe you'll be able to help me with that, I'm just remembering, but 71% of the population at large are totally okay with these things. But I would um, posit that most of them are not traveling all the time, because anybody who's traveling all the time has a problem with them and hates them. And But Ace, um, over at Ace of Spades, he wrote today something similar along the lines as Kevin Drum, and he said... Um, 
Is America freaking out too much over naked body scans? This has been bothering me. On one hand, I'm inclined to just not like invasive pat-downs. On the other hand, I can't help but think we, especially as conservatives, are supposed to be security conscious. But, but here's the thing that um, I'm arguing with and I would argue with Ace about and Kevin about. There is no evidence that these things actually work. At per they're very good at scanning, but are they very good at picking up anything harmful? And and even if they are, the thing that irritates me as a frequent traveler, if we were really serious about security, wouldn't we be concerned about the perimeter of an airport? Wouldn't we be concerned about cars driving up to the airport? I mean, a lot of damage can be done, and it just seems like this is a lot of, you know, people have called it like security theater, and there is definitely a sense of that. And But there are people kind of on the right, too, as ACE demonstrates, saying, you know, um, aren't we supposed to be about security? And But I think the pat-downs can help, but they're still not getting invasive enough to really catch somebody like the crotch bomber. Um, I mean, I don't know if these things are intended. I mean, perhaps they are intended to find someone like the crotch bomber that it's going to get, you know, <laughs> deep down and actually catch. That's the, I, I, I am not an expert enough to know uh, exactly how effective uh, these things are. Um, but... Uh, I mean, this is a classic uh, balancing issue between uh, what's people's privacy and what privacy do you give up once you enter into the public sphere and make a choice to, to go on an airplane. That's not the same thing as being in your house and in, in, your, in your private realm, but these are uh, uh, sticky issues that seem to constantly cut across uh, party lines. Yes, well, it's nice that there's something we can all agree on, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's so rare these days. <laughs> now, another celebrities issue uh, that just came up uh, this week is the uh, trial of Ahmed uh, Galani, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, who was a Guantanamo Bay detainee. He had a traditional uh, criminal court trial on terrorist con conspiracy charges. He was acquitted on the vast number of charges. Uh, he was convicted on one charge that still has a minimum of 20 years, potentially a life sentence still. We don't know what the sentence is going to be yet. And this is uh, whatever, whatever civil liberties ground that was shared on the, on the scanner issue. It is they're definitely not shared, it seems, on uh, left and right on this issue, where most of the commentary on the left is, is saying, see the system works, and those on the right are saying, see the system doesn't. Well, I mean, imagine, though, Bill, if he didn't get get nicked on that technicality I mean he got he, he what he got the sentencing for was for conspiring and this is where the logical leap is and there's somebody who's stupid on this jury it sounds like there was a holdout on the jury and they were just making a trade to get something but if he conspired to murder those people and they ended up dead isn't he guilty of murder I mean so I don't know what happened on the jury I don't know what they weren't allowed to consider in coming to their judgment. But it doesn't feel like justice. And had he gotten off, I would submit to you, it would be a disaster for the Obama administration. And I get the sense that this was all for show. This is to demonstrate how um, outside the law the Bush administration was. And in fact, the day after this happened, the um, Department of Justice spokesman, I can't remember who it was now, but basically said, well, we were, um, you know, having to deal with the fact that the previous administration tortured them. Well, not under the law, they didn't. And so this is, this is the, um, this is the real problem, I think, with where we're at with this, the, 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 uh, charging and then trying well, the judge terror suspects. Well, in this case ruled that uh, what ha the interrogation was not lawful, that the, and, and therefore, it, since it was torture, the evidence was not allowed to be submitted, and that was the main obstacle here. So you have some commentary that to the, to the degree that this uh, did not work, it's not the fault of the Obama administration for taking it to trial, it's the fault of the Bush administration for botching uh, the detaining. Um, but you have uh, Paul Waldman at the American Prospect say, to review, we caught this guy, we tortured him, we put him on trial, although we couldn't use the evidence we got from torturing him, we still convicted him. He is one of four, nearly 400 suspects we have convicted of terrorism-related charges in civilian courts since September 11th, and the lesson is supposed to be that we shouldn't be putting suspected terrorists on trial. Um, 
and uh, over at uh, uh, the Washington Monthly, uh, Steve Bennon said, uh, the Republicans' case is unpersuasive. Not only was Galani convicted of a charge, they were likely to life behind bars, but the track record with military commissions is pretty awful. As Colin Powell noted earlier this year, quote, in the eight years since military commissions have put three people on trial, two of them serve relatively short sentences and are free. One guy is in jail. Meanwhile, the federal courts have put dozens of terrorists in jail, and they're fully capable of doing it. Um, so it's one thing to argue that, yes, bad things can happen, um, mistakes can be made, uh, or in this case, uh, torture can botch your entire case, or the bulk of your case, but it's not as if there is a fail-safe alternative elsewhere, although I would also point out the post you share with me from Glenn Greenwald to uh, the, the never happy Glenn Greenwald uh, uh, was uh, upset that he, it was already established that because he's been labeled an enemy combatant, the Obama administration signaled even if he was fully acquitted of everything, they weren't going to give him up anyway. And the judge uh, was okay with that fact. Uh, so uh, to your point, and this is, I don't see a lot of conservatives acknowledge this so much. I mean, the administration is not taking the Glenn Greenwald purist view here. Um, they're, they're basically saying, look, we're trying to do this as by the book as we can, but we, we, are, we begin this awful situation where we got a bunch of guys with tainted evidence, and some of those people were pretty damn sure they're terrorists, so there's no way in hell we're going to let them out. Right. Well, and this is why on the right, a lot of time you see it viewed as a show trial, because when you know that what you're going, going to do, no matter what happens, th that is not the American justice system, or it shouldn't be. And so, but it does um, work when you are capturing an enemy soldier and he's committed crimes. And so this is the tough issue of how to identify these guys. Um, the, the failure option is what uh, they, they call it over at Powerline. Um, John says over at Powerline, this case illustrates very well the foolishness of according civilian jury trials to captured terrorists. Milani is undoubtedly guilty. Indeed, he confessed long ago. But the appropriate treatment of a captured terrorist with respect to whom obtaining information about potential future attacks is paramount is entirely different from the appropriate treatment of a garden variety um, Criminal And Andy McCarthy says um, he saw the potential for this unjust result shortly after the trial began. Um, both sides have adjusted their presentations to the civilian justice system rules that, as I've been noting in recent columns, have resulted in the suppression of key evidence against the defendant. I imagine this must infuriate people. It still infuriates me after 25 years in the business. Have you, here you have... Uh, Galani. He has confessed to the bombings. He continued to be a top Al-Qaeda operative, even a bin Laden bodyguard, for years afterwards until his capture. And he not only bought the TNT used, but identified whom he got it from, a witness who corroborates his confession was prepared to testify, yet because of a court ruling and DOJ concerns about opening up the interrogation can of worms, defense lawyers know the jury will learn none of this information. So what happens? Galani's lawyer opens the case by telling jurors that in 1998 his client was a babe in the woods who was never a member of Al-Qaeda, never agreed or signed on to bin Laden's edicts to kill Americans, and in his naivete was duped by a friend into buying a truck he had no idea would be used by terrorists to bomb an embassy. And so the, this, the end result might be the same no matter what, but there's a sense that there's no justice. Well, I mean, I understand... Yeah. Glenn Greenwald saying that. I mean, Glenn Greenwald's taking the point where if, you, if, you, if your evidence is tainted, uh, don't have a show trial, don't, uh, don't say you're going to lock up no matter what. If you don't have the goods, let them go. Um, conservatives, conservatives just... <laughs> let I mean, a man go who's killed 225 people. Saying, that's my understanding of Glenn Greenwald's view. I mean, if, 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 I, if I'm right. mistaken, Glenn Greenwald, I apologize, but that's, that would seem to be the logical progression of where he's going with this. Uh, um, Right. What conservatives are saying is we want to keep these guys locked up, and the Obama administration seems to agree. And to the extent there's disagreement on the path you you take to get there, it seems to be a little a little overly technical, and that doesn't jive with the more breathless hyperbolic rhetoric you're getting, like in Puerto Rico, Obama's terrorism failure. Well, uh, I mean, if, you, if, you, if both sides agree that these guys should be locked up, I don't understand why the disagreement has to be so um, high pitched. Well, I, I mean, there's one thing locking him up. There's a whole other thing where 
okay, so we have this guy locked up, but it's 20 years to life. He could get out. I mean, in the, in the federal system, there's no parole, right. if, I, if I remember correctly. And so he's stuck for a while. But even still, this does not – I mean, this is a guy who um, – who was just an evil dude and to have all that evidence suppressed that can't be told against him and then for the jury to be stuck like this i don't know it just doesn't seem like the full home run type of justice that well, it's, this it's, guy I mean, deserves I, it's not a home run when you when you lose on most of your counts um and the question is who's who, whose fault is that is uh, yeah. it, uh, the the awful american justice system or the or the or the way the interrogation was handled previously the just, there's nothing wrong with the American justice system. It's a great system for American citizens who abide by the Constitution. It is not a great system for a terrorist caught in a foreign war. And that's and that comes down to the where there's disagreement. Well, outside of these uh, uh, civil libertarian issues, uh, we have a lot of activity uh, in Congress. Again, Congress came back this week, the first, uh, the first session since the election, although the new Congress people are not sworn in yet. Um, but you're already having the new members starting to make some noise, uh, and the first uh, Tea Party action, I, I would say, was to get the Senate Republican Caucus to agree, although it's not a binding rule, it's an informal agreement amongst themselves, uh, to uh, forego earmarks for the next two years. Uh, uh, are conservative bloggers uh, cheering this, or are any embracing the argument that uh, the Republican Jim Imhoff made, which is, hey, this is all you've done is shift the power of the purse to the president and away from the Congress, and that's not what the, the founders intended. No, that's a weak argument. I think that the the grassroots people are happy about it. I th it seems to me that earmarks are being against earmarks should be something that everybody agrees on because it's it's really a way to grease the system and there's it, it was almost unanimous on the on the right being against earmarks even the most squishy moderate um moderates in whatever depending on how you look at it. so social or fiscal or however seem to understand that this is um, kind of a nasty way to run the system. And so, like, everybody from Eric Erickson to Ed Morrissey to Ala to Ace to the guys over outside the Beltway, everybody who I read was against them. Now, Lisa Murkowski has said that she is, you know, going to, you know, whatever, I'm going to do them anyway. And Lisa Murkowski is who I'd like to be have her wings clipped when it comes to earmarks because – of how she's used them to um, manipulate things politically in her state. I mean, that's one of the reasons you know, why they're uh, a problem. Uh, John Judas at the New Republic uh, uh, arguing to, to Obama that he should not make, because Obama's embraced your argument. He's trying to make common ground with uh, the Tea Party on the earmarks issue. Uh, and John Judas was arguing that this is not the way to get independence. Independents don't care about process. They care about jobs and look, for example, in John Murtha's district in Western Pennsylvania, uh, Murtha, king of earmarks, uh, his, after he passed away, his protege has now won two elections there, uh, despite you know, a very fierce attempt for Republicans to try to oust him. And to your point, Lisa Murkowski basically ran her campaign on, you know, Joe Miller is going to cut off our funding. Uh, and that seemed to have uh, won the day for her. So uh, does that... More on the right, right cause that there's, there's only so much utility out of this argument. I think it's a principal thing. I mean, I, it's it's a principal thing where the conservatives and the Tea Party folks are like, we need to stand for something. Otherwise, how are we different than the left who want to expand the scope and role of the government and use money to do it? And we don't want to stand for that. And so. I think that the, they just want to see some sort of principle coming out of the Republicans who are in, in power now. And earmarks are some, largely symbolic, but there's still a lot of real money going back to districts earmarked for certain pet projects, you know, in the name of, you know, you go through a state and it's, you know, uh, Senator Byrd, for example, you can't, you know, go two miles without tripping over some monument to the, you know, Senator Byrd, and, and it, that's the case in a lot of states. It shouldn't be that way. Now, you had some bloggers on the left hitting um, 
Michelle Bachman, who's one of the more Tea Party identified Republicans, and Lindsey Graham, who certainly is not a Tea Party identified Republican, <laughs> he's been very critical of the Tea Party. Uh, but they both have put a wrinkle in their anti earmark uh, position. Uh, Steve Bennett at the Washington Monthly uh, highlighted Bachman's comments. Uh, uh, advocating for transportation projects in one district, in my mind, does not equate to an earmark. There's a big difference between built funding a teapot museum and a bridge over a vinyl waterway. Uh, ben then says, in here, I see an earmark is bad if Bachman thinks it sounds like an unworthy idea. An earmark is good if Bachman thinks it sounds like an idea with merit. Got it. Uh, and Brad Plumer of the New Republic uh, pointing to some uh, similar comments that Lindsey Graham made. Um, so if the, Graham had said, if the Obama administration and their bureaucrats and federal agencies take action against the best interests of South Carolina, I will take swift action to correct their wrongs. Mm. Uh, and uh, Plumer then said, some context, Graham was in severe danger of a primary challenge from the right of 2004, so it obviously needs to get the Tea Party's good side of bad mouth pork. On the other hand, he's, he's been under pressure to earmark funds for local projects like the Charleston Harbor, which could flow without congressional support. So what does he do? He splits the difference. It's not that he wants to hear Mark. It's just the Obama administration's callous disregard for the good folks of South Carolina might force him to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, any guesses to how many poor King Republicans will find a way to invoke the Graham rule over the next two years? Um, are there conservative bloggers who are nervous that there's going to be some weakening on the principle as uh, the governing goes forward? Um, well, I mean, I was just thinking when you are talking about Michelle Bachman, it was making me laugh because Ron Paul is supposedly like the most libertarian, small government guy, right? But he's been all for earmarks. And and so when... It's what the founders would have Yes, I'm sure. It's exactly what they had in mind. And um, so, you know, his argument, and as is every senator or congressman, is that I'm going to look out for my district or... Uh, my state, and um, so, and the way to do that is to bring at least some of our tax dollars back at the form of earmarks. And um, so, on the on the right, though, I think let's see. Eric Erickson was um, very excited about winning out. He had a couple very pointed um, posts against the. Uh, Mitch McConnell and kind of gloating about him caving to the Tea Party folks and that it was a big win. And um, so, uh, but yeah, people are, I don't know how everybody else feels, but being on the right myself, I, I tr trust a politician about as far as I can throw them. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see how this holds, you know. There's a better chance in the House than there. The Senate, I, I don't hold out much hope because it's a symbolic thing and it's not enforceable, so. Well, also, and, and, you know, Reed has certainly been an earmark defender still. You know, oh, he sure. said recently, I'm going to look out for the people in Nevada. So he's not embracing this as a rule for the entirety of the Senate. Uh, the House will be a different story because it's going to be Republican run. Um, but, I mean, I guess this, 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 there's just two questions here. What would happen if, it, if a bill with earmarks actually clears both houses of Congress? Does Obama sign or veto it? The last time he said, "I don't like these earmarks, but I'm going to sign it because we have an emergency situation. We got to get the, the ball moving." Uh, but the other question is, would the House and Senate ever actually agree on any kind of budgetary matters whatsoever? And so, will any bill like that even get to the House to get to the White House? I don't even know. That might be an issue in the next two years. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, speaking of issues that w could very easily uh, lead to gridlock. Uh, the Deficit Commission, the, so the White House Deficit Commission, they're scheduled to finish their work in two weeks, uh, but they seem to not be moving towards any kind of consensus. They, the, the way the rules are structured, there's 18 members on the commission, 14 of the 18 have to agree, which would uh, be a considerable number of people on both parties agreeing, before uh, Congress would have an informal obligation to take up uh, the recommendations and vote on them. Uh, so uh, the co-chairs of the committee put out their own proposal, just the two of them, the Democrat Erskine Bowles and the Republican Alan Simpson. Uh, and when that happened, uh, the liberal blogosphere, uh, you know, completely slammed them uh, up and down. Uh, and as you were telling me, uh, conservative bloggers you know, shrug their shoulders more on this. Uh, it, it, this is not. This has not been the issue. Not that I'm not insinuating that conservatives don't care about the deficit, uh, but the, what the commission's inner workings don't seem to be uh, grabbing the conservative bloggers' focus. Right. I mean, when you brought up the issue, I went hunting for 
any post, a post, any post, <laughs> and I couldn't find anything. And I had the most I've seen are comments on Twitter by different people saying, like, cautiously, okay, I'm making my way through it. Hmm, there's some interesting proposals in there. We'll see. More has been the reaction. I think there might be a combination of things there, which is one. I read over at Mother Jones, um, and I can't remember who wrote the piece, but basically saying, well, this is, doesn't really matter because um, th this is just two guys' opinion and nothing has come of it. You know, that it's not final, and who knows in this Congress what could happen. But since we're all talking about it, um, you know, but was very dismissive of the whole of everything, just of the whole thing, and especially scornful of the Social Security cuts, whereas on the right, it's kind of like, well, we know we have to make some cuts. Um, well, let's take a look at what they say. But And here's my question for you, Bill. I mean, yeah. there, there was such a hue and a cry on the left. Why do you think that is, one? And two, do, do people on the left just not believe that cuts need to happen? right now in the government? Uh, the primary concern on the left is that the deficit commission is being used as a stalking horse to, to gut Social Security, which the commission themselves actually say, the, 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 the co-chairs say, you don't have to reform Social Security to solve the long-term deficit problem. They purposely say whatever savings we're getting on Social Security is, is separate from that. Um, but they, there's been a conflation of the issue uh, that Peter Orzag in his recent New York Times op-ed um, was very uh, transparent about, saying, you know, it's not that you need to solve Social Security to solve the deficit, but we need to show that we're serious, that the markets will appreciate that if we're serious by taking on Social Security. And it's that kind of more psychological argument that the left is very uh, 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 concerned and upset about. And... Uh, and there's a sense that even if the commission doesn't formally come to an agreement on this, that the president may pursue what Bowles and, and uh, Simpson are talking about anyway. And if he did that, that would definitely divide, you know, the Democratic base. They, what would they be dividing over? Well, I mean, there's, 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 I'm sure there'll be some. I mean, there's there's some people in the broader, uh, you know, the broader Democratic sphere who are more sympathetic. Uh, to doing some kind of, um, you know, adjustment to Social Security. I mean, the, ar the argument that, that has come out of the White House uh, earlier in the Obama administration was, hey, look, someone's going to tweak Social Security eventually. Uh, you, you do hit a point in 2037 where if you literally did nothing, that instead of getting 100% of your of your benefits, you'd get 75%. You'd, there'd be such that it's not that the whole thing would become bankrupt and the whole system falls apart. You'd, there would just be an effective benefit cut. Uh, so you got to do something to avoid that or mitigate that. Uh, and what some of the White House people seem to be saying is, hey, better us. We'll do it mildly than them. Then they'll do something but that's much more, more radical. And there's a lot of folks on the left that don't uh, accept that argument. And Dean Baker in particular, who's an economist and also blogs at uh, his own site, uh, Beat the Press, and a Huffington Post, saying, look, you, uh, it's not an urgent matter. It can wait, and if we do wait, we'll, we'll get out of this uh, deficit hysteria that might produce a more radical change in Social Security than, than is deserved. Uh, so that's where you'll get a, a, a deep split. Uh, you know, my, my Campaign for America's Future colleague, uh, Richard S. Gow, wrote a post called The Six Percenters, looking at the most recent CBS News poll, which asks, what's the, what's the biggest priority right now? 56% say creating jobs and fixing the economy, 4% say the deficit, 2% say change in the tax code. So you're saying, why, why are we having this deficit commission that is only considered a priority by 6% of the country when jobs is first and foremost in people's minds and this commission is not even um, you know, touching upon that? Well, so the, the guys on the left are making the argument that that the size and scope of the government has nothing to do with the creation of jobs. And those on the right would say they're, you know, the more money tied up in the government means there's less money in the private sector. And, and that is, has been a problem for job creation. That is probably the, the, the clearest uh, articulation of the ideological split. <laughs> um, 
And it would actually would be, you have one uh, commission member, uh, Jan Schakowsky, who put out her own, de her own liberal deficit reduction plan um, that you know, gets to uh, actually cuts deficit more than the target that the commission established for itself in 2015, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, cut Social Security benefits, it doesn't uh, forego jobs in the short term, it actually includes $200 billion of extra stimulus in the next two years, uh, but still meets the target through cuts in uh, military spending, more aggressive uh, closing of uh, loopholes on uh, corporate taxes uh, and ending the Bush tax cuts that are, that are skewed to the wealthy uh, on top of some additional health care savings through having a public insurance option and revenues through having a cap on carbon emissions. So uh, there was a good blog post by Derek Thompson at The Atlantic uh, who is sort of right-wing moderate who likes the Simpson-Bowles plan better than Schakowsky's, but at least said, look, this is a deficit reduction plan. <laughs> this does actually reduce the deficit. Uh, and I like the fact that it has the jobs stimulus in there. Uh, I, I just think it should be harder on Social Security and the, and the, the, the pain should not be so concentrated on, on the upper class. Uh, so there's a bit of a you know, dispute there. Uh, but the, so I wouldn't, uh, and I think there are a lot of bloggers who have who have embraced what Chikowsky did. Although you did have David Diane and Fire Dog Lake saying, I, "Hey, I like a lot of elements of this plan, but I wish she had said something that was more specific about jobs and not give the credence to this notion that deficits are first and foremost." Uh, but to your point, I mean, there are, there are cuts that liberals are willing to make, um, but they're largely in the areas of uh, military spending. Uh, and squeezing insurer profits and having and closing tax loopholes, uh, some of which you know the Simpson Bowles plan you know cuts military spending almost as much as Schakowsky did. So one of the interesting parts about the commission is that there, there actually seems to be a bit of a consensus about military spending amongst all this. Not that the Defense Secretary Gates agrees, uh, but there's 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 some consensus around that point. But the bigger flashpoint for the left is um, one Social Security and two. What Simpson's Bowl did on taxes, he takes away a lot of uh, tax incentives that are geared towards the middle class. And uh, Paul Krugman and others have said, look, this is just flat out progressive. Uh, Jonathan Chait, who actually is, is a bit of a deficit hawk on the left, said, look, this just doesn't meet the, uh, the standard of doing deficit reduction in a uh, compassionate way. It's just it's kind of because the, the, it, it put, too much pain is put on the, on the lower class and the middle class. Ah, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, there it's kind of like crunch time, and I think that's why there's more kind of equanimity on the right where people think, okay, this is going to be painful, and it's going to be painful all around. It's always interesting, though, to those on the right when talking about deficits that the left always always goes for defense first off when it's such a fraction of the budget when compared to all the entitlement spending and I think what is going to be tough for the left with this kind of rationale at this point is the bailouts that have happened with the um, with the uh, banks and all these big defaulters type being bailed out and then yet it's we're going to cut things or we're going to increase taxes or we're going to let tax cuts um, and we're going to cut off loopholes and all that kind of talk where people sit there and start feeling nickel and, and dimed even if it doesn't affect them personally they start hearing about it psychologically it's a difficult sell and um, well what we don't know at the end of all this is what is Obama going to do uh, after the commission finishes its work uh, presuming they don't come to a formal consensus so you, you have a Simpson Bowles plan, you have a Schakowsky plan, you also now have an Alice Rivlin plan that arguably is even more uh, harsh than the Simpson Bowles plan from, from a liberal perspective. Uh, I, I imagine there might be more to come, but uh, you know Obama has rhetorically uh, been indicating he wants to take long-range deficit reduction as a top priority over the next two years. Um, you know, to what extent does he mean it? Uh, how specific is he going to get? Uh, is, is he going to take um, you know, pieces from all these different plans and make and make a, one plan his own? Uh, is he going to just do Social Security first and not do the broad deficit reduction plan because that's that's a, even more politically complicated? Not that Social Security is some, some sort of cakewalk. Uh, 
And if he does actually put some numbers on a plan, how do Republicans uh, respond to him? Because obviously anything that Obama does will probably include some <laughs> tax increases on somebody. Bill. And the resistance you're getting from the right is, um, you know, we want to we want to cut the deficit, but any, any tax increase on anybody, no matter how wealthy they are, is, is a no go. Uh, so, I, I, would there be pressure on the right then to come up with their own numbers and show some and show a comprehensive plan, or would they just take pot shots to the president's plan if there's going to be a president's plan? So, I, I, I mean, all this stuff is very unclear to me where it goes from here. Anything the president does that has specificity risks splitting his own coalition uh, and but at the same time might put pressure on the right to put up its own numbers which could risk splitting its own coalition or alienating uh, a moderate so I again I, I think it's a, it's an issue to watch even though the right may be kind of shrugging your shoulders and saying hey Simpson goals is going to go anywhere I'm not sure that means the issue is not going to go anywhere um, I'd be interested if um, he actually put forth a plan. I definitely would be, because that would be counter to anything he's done in the past. I mean, even with Obamacare, it's called Obamacare, but yeah, everybody calls it that, but he didn't really come up with the legislation. It made Robbie did. <laughs> oh, yes. And we plan on reminding him of that, too. But, um, no, I'm just saying that very funny. Uh, actually, no, he didn't. Not in this case, but it's close enough to I understand what you're saying. But that's the interesting thing about President Obama. He has not put forth a lot himself. He's kind of let the legislators do it. And no, that's, that's been his legislative strategy, and he's taken a lot of flack you know, from the left. Right. Uh, actually, actually, left, right, and middle on that point. You know, he's not leading enough. He's not fighting enough. Uh, you know, I'm one to, to point out that you know, Bill Clinton did a lot of stuff, which was, here's my plan from the mountaintop. You know, pass it. And that proved to be a recipe for legislative failure because the Congress people did not have their own stake and buy in the legislation. They didn't craft the deals themselves. And so when there was some friction, they, they walked. Um, you know, criticized the president. I mean, and that's why the president's an unsaleable figure. But at the end of the day, he did get a lot of stuff passed through this strategy of having some deference to the legislature. On this case, though, I mean, the whole idea of having a deficit commission was, look, anything that involves long-range deficit reduction is going to involve, you know, big political risk. And you're not going to get there unless both parties, you know, hold hands, grit their teeth, and jump together. And it's pretty clear from this commission that they're just not going to do that. So if they're not going to do it, but you as president are, are, have said repeatedly that deficit reduction is a serious uh, part of your long-range agenda, uh, you have to do it yourself because no one else is going to step up for you. And so, again, I, I don't know what he is going to do, but that question is going to come up pretty quickly, I think. Well, you wonder if he's going to triangulate his own party. I mean, he so and the thing is, there's a lot of moderate um, senators um, up for reelection in 2012, and the mood of the populace is certainly not um, making the government bigger. Um, it's you know, a lot of people got elected this time around by promising to decrease the size and scope of the you know government. And now, how are they going to do that? Are they going to deliver on it? And is President Obama going to sign on to it? And are the Democrats going to sign on to it? And I think the hue and the cry on the left demonstrates that they're in no mood. And so the, I, think it's, I think the Democrats are going to be kind of caught in a bind in a way. Well, the, the commission, the Simpson-Bowles plan, literally puts a cap on the size of government at 21% of GDP, which is lower than where it is is today. Um, and uh, uh, Dean Baker, one of his posts on the subject was, this is a completely arbitrary number. Uh, it, 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 it holds some actual economic significance. It must be, he sort of sarcastic, it must hold some sort of religious significance for them. But there's no actual economic basis to pick that number of, of any number. Uh, and I don't know if the president would want to uh, embrace a number like that to show he wanted to constrain the size of government, but you don't have to do that. I mean, Jan Schakowsky did not pick an arbitrary number to cap the size of government to get the budget into on the path to the balance. You can, you can balance the budget at, at many levels at different sizes of government. Uh, so I mean, the Republicans like to say this is a, it's a spending problem, not a revenue problem. Uh, 
But that's I would I would not argue that that is an agreed upon opinion with the broader American people. Really, uh, you don't think that a nearly a trillion dollar stimulus package that was promised the world and netted next to zip um, doesn't matter to the American people? I would submit that it does. I, I would not uh, agree with the premise of your <laughs> characterization of the Recovery Act, but I would say there. <laughs> I, I think there is a tension with the broad middle of the public between um, wanting government to do things and skepticism that they're going to do it well. And, you know, the, there was support for the stimulus upon passage. It wasn't there was an intrinsic, I hate this old concept. Um, but there was a feeling that it wasn't working. And I think that speaks to more of a question of effectiveness as opposed to size. Uh, Although, obviously, the president would argue, and I would argue, that it did work as far as it could. It did create up to 3 million jobs. It's just that the hole was, was much bigger than, uh, than the stimulus was able to fill. Uh, so uh, where the, the president has, has tried to lay a marker is to say, I can be a more effective steward of government. Uh, and to the degree that the economic picture may or may not look better in 2012, people's uh, trust in government uh, might be different than where it is today. Uh, so I, I, think the, I think you're right that there was a, a, a tipping towards the skepticism side uh, in this midterm election because the stimulus was not perceived as being effective. Um, by doing that is, is the same as definitively saying people want smaller, smaller government no matter what. Right. Well, I, I actually happen to agree with you there. And this will irritate a lot of conservatives on my side, but I have been saying for quite some time that the American people kind of are have been over the last two years standing on the edge. You know, they don't know what they, they know they don't want this and they know they don't want that, but what do they want? Well the the notion of cutting off their personal pet happy project doesn't make them happy. And so I'm not sure that the American people are quite sure what they want from their government right now. And and so some and where we're at in the legislate in Congress and with the presidency, it's kind of all clear as mud. And so I'm not sure there's going to be a whole lot of clarity coming from Washington over the next two years because there's going to be a lot of elbowing, figuring things out. And a lot of stuck government, I think. But I'm not sure about that either. We'll see. Uh, I, I, mean, I agree with everything you said about where I think the American people are, and I agree with everything, I, I, the likelihood of actual action from the government, whether it is in a, you know active government sense or in a cutting back government sense, I would imagine it's just going to be gridlock over the next two years. So you essentially have an Obama agenda partially implemented, um, and people will probably judge that in 2012, depending on how well the economy is doing, even though a lot of these things, you know, health care doesn't get flipped into 2014, but people will look at it in the prism of how well the economy is doing. Uh, although there's an argument that, again, that John Judas was, was putting forth in that New Republic piece saying, look, since the economy is not going to be better, and because Republicans are not going to help you uh, do anything about it, you got to put forth your own plan and fight for it, and when Republicans block it, blame them for it not happening. And so he's basically arguing for a sophisticated blame game, uh, and uh, I don't I don't know if Obama's going to take that advice or not. It doesn't seem like that's where he's going. He's, he's still talking about let's see how well we can work together. But uh, I don't know. He's kind of the chief blamer in charge, man. I mean, if there the Republicans have been in the definitive minority in the House and the Senate, and he still managed to talk about obstructionism, and in so many cases. The Democrat votes are there to overcome the so-called obstruction. So it's kind of, you know, they want one Republican so that it, something looks bipartisan, have some cover. I don't know. It's, it's, it's been a tough sell, the whole blaming thing. And I expect it. And one of the reasons why I thought it was to President Obama's advantage for the Republicans to at least to take over the House is because he would have somebody to blame. And that, that would be the strategy because – you know, when nothing happens, then at least there's a scapegoat. Well, I think that what you touch upon there, I think, is the, the hard, one of the hardest reasons for Obama to successfully play a blame game when things get gridlocked is that it generally is not just Republicans that are obstructing. Right. Um, there's a faction of Democrats that join them in the obstruction because the party is ideologically split. Uh, not split down the middle, but there's enough of a split that even though you might have 
you know, technically had the numbers to get stuff done. Uh, you didn't effectively have the numbers to get stuff done. Uh, and, you know, Obama is not willing to, to uh, blame people in his own party about stuff, certainly in the, in the mid of a heat election season. Uh, but, and so he, so he, when he comes with this, gets to the question of how do you become an effective messenger, a lot of people knock the bomb front having a strong message. But when you say on Labor Day announce, I, I want to have another $50 billion in infrastructure investment, and a lot of your vulnerable candidates don't support you. Right. How do you have coordinated party messaging? You can't. Right. Uh, so that makes that makes the blame game uh, hard to execute. Well, how can you have a coordinated message when in 75% of the places where you're taking that message, that message is being rejected? So the poor Democrats going back trying to, you know, sell certain things to their districts had a tough time. I mean, some of them, some of them who were in super safe districts, um, didn't, but you know, politics is a game of winning the middle and of persuasion. And I don't believe that either side has been doing a very effective job of that. And so you see the independence, like, you know, it's like being on a ship, you know, the, the ship goes one way and everybody rolls one way and then it goes back the other way, <laughs> but nothing's happening. You're not making any forward motion. Uh, I agree again, perhaps we should leave it on, on that, uh, that common ground note. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, it's been good to talk to you again, Melissa. Good to talk to you, Bill. It's a pleasure. Uh, take, tell folks again where they can find your work. LibertyPundits.com and .net. Excellent. And also on Twitter, at Melissa Tweets. And I'm on Twitter myself at Bill Share, uh, as well as Liberal Oasis and LiberalOasis.com and our future.org. Um, that will do it for this week. We'll see you next week on This Week in Blog.